So we're having this interesting thing happen in our home where we've been trying to educate our twin girls that are now seven that like you have to be in tune to your own body when you're hungry, right? Like, like you need to eat until you're full or like if you need to go to the bathroom, like you need to like recognize that in yourself, right? We've also been trying to teach them how to like also kind of be in tune with their own attitude because there's a lot of emotions in the home. So we're kind of like, hey, like only you can be happy, right? Like you get to decide. No one can make you unhappy, only you can be happy. But now there's been screaming matches between both of the girls where they'll both be upstairs and one of them will be like, you ruined my day. And the other would be like, I can't ruin your day. I don't control your body. <laughs> and it's like this whole, it's like, and it's this whole thing is like, you don't know what's happening in my body right now. And it's like really kind of backfired in, in, the, big, yeah. in the big scheme of things. I will tell you a, the whole attuned with your hunger thing. I'm still trying to teach Natalie that, and she's 30 years old. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, nice. So, well, welcome to the Back to Basics podcast. This is a podcast where me, Jason, and my brother, Chris, an ER physician, I'm a nurse and firefighter paramedic, never get the intro right, ever. We don't. But what we do is we take complicated medical uh, products, no, we take complicated medical topics and we break them back down to basics so that you can understand them. That's what we do. Today's topic... It's called CO2 and you. We're going to be talking about capnography. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like that title. So we're going to talk about capnography, a very misunderstood and unappreciated vital sign. It's also still so underutilized. I mean, like, I'm, yeah. I'm at the point now, like, where I guess no one's just ever going to use it. Like, it's an amazing it's not, tool. You can't say that. We're trying to be all agents hope is, of change. All hope is lost. CO2 missed its day. Like, like it, and it, this is something that, like, Jason and I have done things on before, it's like end tidal CO2 and capnography is such an underutilized tool and can give you so much amazing information. And we, I don't know why we still just don't because, really use it. Yeah. I think in EMS, it's a diagnostic tool and EMS isn't particularly interested in diagnostic tools because it doesn't let them do something. Right. Yeah. I think in nursing and in-house stuff, it tells you some pretty acute data. But I'll be honest with you, even in the ERs that I work, like when I like travel and do like work in different community ERs, like you'd be surprised how often it's like, oh, we don't know, we can't find the cap the capnography plug in, or we can't. It's like, I don't understand why it's just not always there. I don't know why it's just not a part of like every monitor. It just it seems like it should just always be hooked up and always like I don't personally don't know why you would use any other nasal cannula other than one that also gives you. Yeah, that's a point that I brought up back in the day with my fire department. They're expensive. I think it might be part of it because yeah. that end title, I guess. I don't know. It's just like an no extra idea. piece of plastic yeah, I don't really get, hole. Yeah, but I, maybe because the, the technology. Yeah, because you have to like screw the little thing into the deal to monitor it. You know, all those technical speak. <laughs> like I, I recently spoke with a fire department that was like, and we got all this great data about CO2. And I was like, how did you get this data? And they were like, we put capnography on every respiratory patient we had. And I just wanted to be like, that shouldn't be an accomplishment. That should be like the baseline standard operating procedure. If you have a respiratory patient in general, why aren't we getting an title on them? You know what I mean? No, I agree. I agree. And we don't do it in the ER either. And I think nursing doesn't get educated as much as they could on entitled CO2 and capnography. So we are going to take care of that today. Well, and people put so much emphasis on pulse oximetry (laughs) readings. And when you look, when you compare the two, Obviously, a combination of both is what we want. But when you compare the two, like, capnography can tell me a lot more about what's going on than an, than yeah. an SpO2 reading, Absolutely. in my opinion. Yep. But So we are going to clear up some of the myths and legends around CO2 and break it down to basics, because that's what we do. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, first thing that we got to really touch on is, one is the... The pillars of respiratory physiology is what we're going to call them, Mm -hmm. all right? So the difference basically between ventilation, perfusion, oxygenation, and diffusion, right? So a lot of times, especially like talking about the SpO2 thing, right? We look at one thing. We look at one set of data, and we're really, we're looking at oxygenation. Really, we're only looking at like a piece of oxygenation when we look at SpO2 because it's basically how saturated your hemoglobin is with something. It doesn't necessarily even have to be oxygen, right? right? But we look at that and we think, oh, they're perfusing fine. They're 100%. That means they're perfusing fine. That means that they're diffusing fine. That means that they're ventilating fine. And it's like you don't have any of that data. You so have one data point. This right? is the soapbox that I like to get on. I love it. Is we soapbox. talk about, and you guys may have heard me talk about before, but assumptions we make in healthcare. Assumptions... We make in healthcare. I've heard this so many times yeah. that 
but it's always relevant. And it's not just to this. Oh. I mean, this is a great example of it. I think this is kind of where my soapbox speech on assumptions came from, is talking about the difference between ventilation, perfusion, oxygenation, yeah. diffusion. But it plays out in a lot of things. Even in a podcast we recently did with EMS 2020, where we looked at maybe some assumptions that were made by medics in the field on MIs and bradycardia and hypotension. and Yeah, note on that, people <laughs> did not love our response. Well, I stand by not, what we said. Did people not re- like it or did the person who submitted it not like it? I don't know. It's been implied maybe both. I. It's not that they didn't like the response. They wanted more discussion on basically epinephrine versus dopamine as like which is the better presser presser and there's like this argument about like well contractility and inotropy this is a tangent but inotropy of the heart using shocking like isn't epi a better alternative and it's like when you're shocking the heart it's contracting like so right. it's an inotropic Again, mechanism it was too. it's incorrect assumptions being made about like yeah we could talk about that in it's a like different talking, context. It's because... like talking about what kind of high blood pressure medication a patient should be on when they got hit by a car. That's kind of where yep. that, that's where the point was moot in that case. Right. But, but anyway. take a listen. It's called, what did we name that one? Pacing Presser Pressure. Ooh. Episode 48. I like it. Should be the one right before this one. I like it. I get a little heated in it. I think Chris... This dark side comes out. <laughs> <laughs> so. Anyway, so assumptions we make in healthcare, right? We have we have to make assumptions in healthcare, mm-hmm. right? I mean, like mo- this is both science and art. You hear us talk about this all the time, too, right? The science of medicine and the art of medicine. In order to bridge that gap, you have to make assumptions, right? We get limited data, and and as technologies advance, as we learn new things, like we get more data. But we have to take that data, we have to interpret it, and based on that, make assumptions of what's going on inside the body. A lot of times, right? Where we make a lot of assumptions in this con- in the t- context of the conversation today is around oxygenation, pulse ox, and perfusion. Mm. So what we ha- and, and that's not always a bad thing. That's not always a bad thing. We can make those assumptions many times. But we have to understand that we're, my argument always is that we have to understand we're making these assumptions because they don't always fit. And you need to know when they don't fit so that you just don't make them and don't realize that these are assumptions, not facts, right? So as we define these different things, there's ventilation, there's perfusion, there's oxygenation, and there's diffusion, all right? Ventilation is simply the movement of air in and out of your lungs. Right. Right. And if I'm perfusing well, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm ventilating well, right? Correct. Now, if, if I don't have a way to get air in and out of my lungs, it doesn't really matter how effective my diffusion is of how well my cells are offloading oxygen and, and or offloading CO2 and, and onboarding oxygen, right? right. Like, th- they are separate things. Now, granted, if I stop ventilating, eventually I will stop perfusing because the whole process is going to... You, you throw a, a wrench into any of these mechanisms, the other ones are going to suffer for it. Right, right. But again, looking at a pulse ox reading doesn't give me any information on someone's ventilation. Well, here's the that thing. I mean, like, if you do the test yourself at home, right? So let's talk about... So if ventilation is simply the movement of air in and out of the lungs, Right. We make a lot of assumptions. We make assumptions then that if you are ventilating, if you're moving air in and out of the lungs, that you must be oxygenating, right? And we look at a pulse ox, and we do it vice versa too. We look at a pulse ox and we say 98% on room air, they must be ventilating. However, again, do this test. Like I said, do it. Do it. Whatever clinic you work at, put a pulse ox on yourself, have it read 100%, and then hold your breath. And I guarantee you, your pulse will read 100%, probably until you have to take another deep breath. I bet you that would actually never drop enough to have you indicated to you as a clinician that someone had stopped breathing and ventilating at that point, right? right. Because we've talked about this before, hemoglobin and red blood cells carry a lot more oxygen than we used to think. So they actually, we actually have time. We can hold our breath for quite a while and our body continues to oxygenate, right? Or still has oxygen involved, right? Yes. So perfusion, well, let's go to, let's go to oxygenation next. So that's ventilation. Oxygenation is delivery of oxygen to the tissues, right? Right. So we look at a pulse ox and we say hundred percent. That means that the hemoglobin is hundred percent saturated. We assume with oxygen, right? That's oxygenation. Well, there's a couple of ways we have to get that oxygen to those tissues, right? And that's perfusion. That's where we were Perfusion relying. is the delivery of blood to tissues. So 
I can have, and here's where the assumptions happen, like I assume that if I have 100% oxygen saturation, that I must be perfusing well, meaning that like the only way to get the oxygen to the tissues for me to measure it is for my blood to get it there. And again, 90 some percent of the time, perfectly good assumption to make. But the examples we like to throw out there is like, what about a TIA? What about a stroke? What about a heart attack? In many cases, I'm not perfusing certain parts of my body, like my heart in an MI or my brain in a stroke, but my pulse ox doesn't change because oh, I'm, I'm, I'm measuring the oxygen saturation in my peripheral tissue, right? So can I make the assumption that I'm perfusing well across the board? Not necessarily, right? We just have to know that we're making those assumptions. And finally, the last thing is diffusion, which is the movement of oxygen and CO2, you know, to get it onto the hemoglobin and off of the hemoglobin. At a, cel at a cellular level, right? right? So, like, this is where, like, toxicology and, like, chemical interrupters and things can come into it, right? So, if we have issues with how our cells are respiring, basically, right? Like, our cellular respiration is off. It doesn't really matter that our ventilation is fine. It doesn't really matter that our fluid is moving around and taking th those cells places. We're not getting the oxygen to the tissue, ultimately, because the cells aren't onboarding oxygen well, mm -hmm. right? Right. And there's even, a number of things that can do that. Even in the lungs, right? So, like, let's take each of these. By, for us to, like, truly have each of these working correctly, I have to bring air into my lungs. Ventilation ventilation it has to diffuse from my alveoli into the bloodstream diffusion right kind of it then the has to what's that so you kind of buried the lead on that one sorry diffusion it then has to go onto the hemoglobin and travel to the tissues oxygenation and perfusion right yeah exactly right, right. oxygenation and perfusion um and then again that oxygenation is the delivering that oxygen to the tissues for energy so that's the kind of the oxygenation piece right, right. so in most cases we look at a pulse ox, I think, a lot of times and assume all four of these are working. Right. We look at it, we see 100% on room air. We assume that they're bringing air in and out, that it's diffusing across the alveoli, no problem. It's getting to the tissues and it's being offloaded without any issue. And there's a lot of cases where that's just not the case, right? Like the ones I gave already, a stroke and MI, that's not true in those specific tissues. If I've got a bunch of fluid buildup on my lungs, right, I have a diffusion problem. So... I'm not, maybe my delivery of the tissue, my perfusion is fine, but my pulse ox is low just because I got a bunch of fluid buildup. That doesn't mean I have a perfusion issue. Whereas normally we'd say, oh, they're perfusing fine because their oxygen levels are high. So we just have to like, again, this is the soapbox I like to get on. We just have to know we're making these assumptions and when so that we know not to make them in certain situations. Right. What do yeah. we do when we assume? You make an ass out of you and me. I was going to say we sum huh? ace. What? There's other ways that you can break down that word to like make it more fun. I don't want to say you make an ass out of you and me because it's okay to assume is what we're saying. Sometimes. Sometimes. So some, S-U-M, sometimes it's okay to assume. <laughs> no. Me. No. Yeah, I'll get it. I'll get it. It's, it's coming. It's <laughs> I'll not, figure it out. It's I'll figure it out. It's not All right. Yet. So cool. Four, those are the four pillar, pillars of respiratory physiology, right? We need to know those before we get into like how capnography can play a part. Now, we're not suggesting that you only use capnography and that's going to answer all these questions for you, right? It is another data set that can help you understand respiratory pathology when there's issues going on with a patient having a respira right. and re it is respiratory worth, issue, right? It is worth noting that like a pulse oximetry really only shows you the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin in the peripheral tissues. And, and again, because like because because we're going to start talking about what capnography can tell you, and it actually can tell you a lot more than just that. That's all that the pulse ox can really tell you. That's it. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't, I didn't listen to anything you just said because I'm still trying to figure out a fun, fun way to take <laughs> assume and make it sound like something else. But I'll get that. All right. All right. All right. Um, cool. So how do, we use a, how do we use capnography? Like what is it? So it's measurement of CO2. End tidal CO2 specifically. So basically the amount of CO2 that we're exhaling at the end of our breath, the most amount of CO2 that we're exhaling at the end of our breath. Okay. And the reason is because like if you take a deep breath and you blow it out, that is considered your tidal volume. The amount of air you bring in, in and out during that period is your tidal volume. Mm -hmm. So the end tidal CO2 is the amount of CO2, you, the max amount of CO2 you've exhaled at the end of that tidal breath. Yeah. Now, does it really matter whether we're measuring like the end versus the beginning versus the dirt? No, we just, we decided to measure the end. Like that's, that's our, our standard of measurement when we're 
looking at CO2 as a whole. Main right? title CO2 sounded weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how do we do it? Well, we use typically about like three tools. There's like an something like an easy cap would be like the simplest way, right? If you just wanted to find out if there's a decent amount of CO2 coming out and someone has respirations, you can basically cap their tube if they're tubed. You can cap their tube with this thing called an easy cap and it has this litmus paper in it that reads acidity. So one thing that's really important to understand for both like respiratory and metabolic acidosis and understanding kind of like acid base balance and understanding capnography and just cellular respiration in general is CO2 is an acid, right? It makes sense. Like our body generates CO2 after chemical reactions with oxygen, right? It takes the oxygen. It needs to offload garbage. It offloads that garbage in the form of CO2. Okay. CO2. If you, if you, yeah, an easy trick is just to remember that CO2 is an acid in the body as you begin to figure out how your body is compensating for, you know, really like the, when your, when your cells stop respirating, like when you, when you halt cellular respiration, which like eventually leads to death, acidosis is a part of that, right? Like any, if you've seen anybody who has, you know, died from sepsis or, you know what I mean? Like anybody who's been in the ICU, like, like acidosis is a end part of a dying process. Right. So, and on a cellular level, like cells die because they're full of junk and that junk is CO2 mm -hmm. as well as other things. Right. So, um, so this easy cat basically has this litmus paper in it, same st stuff that you'd see like in a chemical, you know, study where they like dip it and it turns a different color, right? Same thing. If it turns yellow, it means it's reading acid. It's reading CO2, which would tell you that you're you've got good respiration there, right? If it's purple, then it's too basic and it means they're they're probably not breathing well. So what we use this for a lot of times is to check the, basically the, uh, if we have proper placement of an, uh, of an ET tube. So if we intubated a patient, we put a tube down their throat, we want to make sure that that tube goes into the lungs or the airways instead of the stomach, right? So if I put a little easy cap on that and it stays purple, uh-oh, I'm in the stomach because the stomach isn't breathing out CO2, right? So I need to re-intubate, extubate and re-intubate. Right? Where you have to be careful, again, with these kind of things, is that any acid will turn that paper from purple to yellow. Mm -hmm. So if it gets contaminated, if somebody vomited or somebody, like, it could turn, you know what I mean? Like, that could cause it to turn yellow because it's just measuring acid, not specifically CO2. We're assuming it's CO2 when we're bagging someone and the air is coming back out and turning it that yellow from purple. But again, just yeah. recognize that any acid can turn that. And that if they're exposed to air for too long, they can just read yellow sometimes, which is, like, not the best. Right. Thing. And easy cabs aren't the best tools. They're, they're just sort of a... A simple, cheap way to be able to kind of check this, right? Yeah. That's not really reading end tidal CO2. It's just reading the presence of CO2, right? The other options we have are basically either nasal capnography or inline capnography. So a, a nasal capnography, like nasal cannula, is basically we take the nasal cannula, the thing that goes in your nose and gives them oxygen. Um, we take that tubing. It has this added little reservoir at the tip of it that reads basically CO2 coming from your nose or your mouth. It can read that CO2 and give you a fairly accurate reading uh, based on your expiration. Um, the, did I say expiration? I meant exhalation. Yep. No one should be expiring. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. So, and then but in, if they line, did, and tidal CO2 could help clue we'll, you in. And we'll get to we'll that. Talk to that. <laughs> so um, inline capnography would be basically a, it's in line with your endotracheal tube. Yeah, so That's you attach it to the tube, and then you attach the BVM basically on top of that. And then as you're uh, doing respirations for that patient, because you're squeezing the bag, maybe you're breathing for them, you can still see their exhalation and read their CO2. So there's going to be different CO2 readings for me when I'm up and breathing and talking to you, and you put a little nasal on me, and you're reading that. And if Chris is dead on the ground, there's still going to be CO2 readings, but how high are they going to be? It depends on what's going on. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So, so, the, so that's how we, those are the tools that we use to capture end tidal CO2. Right. And then there's, there's, there's kind of two slash three pieces of information we get from that, right? So the first thing is just a number, and that is our end tidal CO2. That is how many milligrams of mercury of CO2 are present at the end of breath, right? right? Normally, in a normal, healthy person, it should be between 35 and 45. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the number you'll see. A lot of times you'll also see a waveform, right? And that's the capnogram. 
we call that a capnogram. So that is a waveform. No, that's a capnograph. The capnograph is the combination of the two. Am I mixing them up? Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. So the capnogram, capnogram is the waveform, wave form. which is kind of BS. Why wouldn't they call the thing that looks like a graph the capnograph? I think the graph has to have numbers on it. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, it's just a drawing. Mm-hmm. Exactly. When you assume. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Exactly. So so you've got n tidal CO2, which should fall between 35 and 45. It's just a number. You've got a capnogram, which is a waveform. And when you put those two together, which what most devices do, is you see a number and you see the waveform, and we call that a capnograph. Because it has to have numbers on it. Yes. Capnography. Right. Exactly. Awesome. So what do we do with this information? Well, first, we kind of have to understand the number, and we have to understand the waveforms, right? So the number, like you said, normal is 35 to 45, right? We'll talk about what happens if we see a higher or a low number, what that means. It can kind of confuse people. But first, let's go over kind of the waveform sections. So Jamie has promised me that there is going to be a picture of a capno graph. graph. Anagram. Anagram. <laughs> <That's a part laughs> Basically, of pop up on the screen, right? Wait for it. Now. All right. If you look at this chart, this is a normal waveform. Waveform capnography reading, right? So you're going to see these nice, basically like troughs and peaks, and you're going to have like a plateau at the top of those peaks. So the idea is that I believe if I'm familiar with this chart enough, at point A, we start to Exhale. breathe out. So right. this is where people get confused because like you're used to seeing a pulse oximetry. That is somebody breathing in and it goes up. Mm -hmm. And then when they breathe out, it goes down. This is the opposite. So as they breathe out, we're measuring CO2 and it's go the CO2 is going up. So you got to remember this is, an ex this is a graph of an exhalation. Yeah. So as I breathe out, my CO2 is increasing, 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 increasing. And eventually I'm breathing out as much as I can at the end of my breath. And there's a second or two there where... I'm pushing out the most amount of CO2 that I can for a designated amount of time. And that's where you get this expiratory plateau at the top, right? We want to see a nice flat line there. Then as I inhale, the CO2 starts to drop, 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 drop. And then we have technically like an inspiratory plateau at the bottom, right? Yeah. Like this trough where it's going to be flat, so where we, we're, in, we're breathing in. So no CO2 is being read on that monitor at all. Right. So point A is the time that we start to exhale. Point B on the graph is basically where we're kind of getting to that plateau phase where we have exhaled the, like starting to exhale the most amount of CO2 we can. It may creep up a little bit more and at point C is where we measure our end tidal CO2. Because at point C, we start, we take a breath in and CO2 immediately drops to zero because nothing's coming out to read. So that point C becomes your end tidal. So whatever that number is, what sometimes you, like, so usually between 35 and 45, Let's say it's 37, right? That's your end tidal CO2. I so badly want you to be wrong about this chart and there to be like an L in it. No. And people are like, what? Are you sure it goes yeah. A, B, C, D? That's all there is on it? I don't even know if D. I think there might be an E. There's not. I looked at it yesterday. I mean, there might be a D in the E, which is just the period of time between your where you're breathing in. Top at the part? End. That top flat part? <laughs> yeah, expiratory. Okay. Right. Expiratory plateau. All right. Anyway. So we get these nice these nice plateaus. We should have these nice, very boxy, square breaths, right? So the one of these can tell us some information about how someone is breathing. All of these can tell us the rate of how they're breathing, right? Mm -hmm. The combination of that data can confuse people. So here's the thing. If I'm hyperventilating, I'm breathing a lot. It makes sense practically to think that I am, I, there's more CO2 overall that I've kicked out over time, right? If I start going, <laughs> I'm going to kick out a bunch of CO2 and left over, I'm not going to have that much CO2. So when we talk about like acid base left over in my body, I'm going to actually have like some alkalinity versus acidity because I'm breathing off all that acid. That would right? be what we call, so since the, the primary issue is you're breathing too fast, it's respiratory. And because you've breathed off a bunch of your CO2, you've gotten rid of, of a bunch of acid, you're now alkalotic. So it's respiratory alkalosis. So in that case, what's going to happen to our number, our end tidal CO2, will drop. So when we're hyperventilating, our end tidal CO2 will go down because we're breathing off our CO2. Because, yes, because our number, though, has to do with one breath versus all of the breaths. 
Right. Right. So people get confused and they're like, well, wait a minute, but I'm breathing off more. And you have to imagine it like it's a bus stop, right? If there's a bus stop and every five minutes it's getting people on it, it's not going to have that many people on each bus, right? So smaller waveform, but lots and lots of more buses, right? Lots, lots of more waveforms, but smaller waveforms. If the bus is only coming once every hour, I'm hypoventilating. I'm only breathing once every, you know, 45 seconds. <laughs> I am going to have a huge wave because we're trying to offload as much as we can on that bus. All the CO2 is jumping on that bus and every hour that bus is going. Is the bus thing confusing you? I don't think You're so. You're looking at me kind of confused. All right, we're going to have Jason clarify this analogy one time just to make sure we didn't lose anybody. Okay, so how I just explained it off camera to Chris is let's say my end title reading is 25. Remember, so each breath I'm kicking out, did I say 25 or 20? It's going to make more sense of 20. I'm not very good at math. So let's say every breath. Let's just keep, let's just keep, let me do it. Let me explain it back to you the way you just explained it to me off camera because <laughs> okay. I don't want people to be confused. Okay, All right. so end title CO2 will go down when you're hyperventilating. And where this confuses people is they look at one waveform and they see a number that says 20 and they say, okay, they're breathing off less CO2. That must mean they're retaining some. No. What's happened is that over time they have breathed off so much CO2 that they've lost it. And that's why that number is down. So you just don't want to get confused there. Right. Uh, uh, an end title reading of 20, 10 times is 200 overall, right? An end title reading of 30 five times is only 150. So in the higher number per breath, I gave off less CO2 overall. In the lower number per breath, because there's way more breaths, I'm giving off more CO2. Right. So just remember, when you're hyperventilating, you're still kicking off way more CO2 than when you're breathing normal. Yep. The number, though, the individual breath number is going to be lower. Yes. Correct. And that's like the hardest thing to understand when it comes to capnography. That makes sense. Right. So what's going to happen to the waveform then too, right? So if we're hyperventilating, there's going to be more of them, right? There's going to be more exhalation periods. So we're going to see more waves. But the shape should be relatively the same. The shape should be the same because I'm still breathing it off the same way I was breathing out before. But the waveforms are also kind of probably be skinnier, right? They're going to be shorter because I'm, I'm doing it faster, right? Mm -hmm. So they're going to be, there's going to be more of them. They're going to be shorter. They're going to be smaller, right? Uh, the way they look, the shape should be the same, and the number is going to be lower, right? Because we're breathing off our CO2. We have less CO2 available because we've breathed a bunch of it off. And hypoventilation is just going to be the opposite, right? So we're going to have less breaths, less waveforms, same shape, way larger waveforms because we're like a higher number and larger waveform because we're breathing off more in between. Mm -hmm. Overall, though, when you're hypoventilating, you are starting to retain CO2. You're not getting enough of it out of your body because when we multiply those waveforms together, there's lots of, lots of CO2 that we, or there's not that much CO2 that we've given off, right? So hopefully that wasn't too confusing, but that's basically hyperventilation and hypoventilation. So here's the thing is if I'm bagging somebody, I'm breathing for somebody, and I notice that their end title is down. So their end title on their breath, on one breath is let's say 25. What do I need to do for that patient? You need to slow down. You need to slow down. And yeah. that's what confuses people. They think low number, I need to give more. No, no, no. Low number means you need to slow down their respiration. So that CO2 down, build back right? up. Yep. And if I see a high number, what do I need to do? I need to speed it up, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll see that kind of balance out. You'll see less waveforms and you'll start to see those numbers start to balance out. So that's what we're looking What's for. What's nice about this too is that this is a way to measure treatments effectiveness as well, right? So if I have someone who's got a low CO2 and they're hyperventilating, and obviously we're going to talk about like, we, we got to look at other reasons that they might be hyperventilating. Is that, Are they hyperventilating because that's the primary issue? They're anxious. They're maybe they're just hyperventilating. Are they hyperventilating because they've got an acidotic problem? They're trying to get rid of CO2 through the breath so that they can balance internally. But once we know that as we give treatments, we now have something to watch, right? So it's not a matter of like, did the pulse ox go from 98% to 100%? It's how do, how is, are my waveforms shortening bec or are they getting longer? Are they, you know, is that number growing or getting, so like we, there's more we can look at to see how effective our treatments are as we start to like measure CO2 as well. Exactly. That's basically waveform amount and that gives us hyperventilation, hypoventilation. Let's talk a little bit about shape changes though. So we're just going to give one example. There's lots of things that you can discover from shape changes if you kind of apply that practicality of understanding what each part of the waveform does. But what I want to explain is like asthma is the easiest way to kind of show you what would happen with the waveform and how you can recognize that. Okay.
if I'm having like an asthma attack, there's air trapped in my lower airways, right? Because of secretions and because of constriction of the bronchioles, like I, I have air that's trapped in there. Because of that, my expiratory phase, not my end expiratory phase, so not the top of the plateau, but my, my I have a prolonged expiratory phase as I try to breathe out, right? And I don't really plateau anymore because my end expiratory phase is like half a second. And really we can see this with any restricted lung disease, right? So COPD, emphysema is going to look the same way too. Like what are the telltale signs of like asthma, COPD is this prolonged expiratory phase. So if I'm going to prolong how long I'm pushing that out, I'm not going to get this sharp increase in CO2. I'm going to get this kind of more prolonged phase until it peaks. And if you look at the screen right now, you'll see what this kind of looks like. It's called we, shark fin. call this shark fin because it looks like a shark fin. I and think. it makes sense, right? Because you're breathing, you're breathing out Basically, you're forcing that CO2 out, and then you're not, you don't have this expiratory, this end expiratory phase where you're able to with, withstand breathing out, breathing out, breathing out the max amount. You're forcing the air out. You're going, whoosh, whoosh. and so that's going to shark fin it, and then you're going to see a steep drop on the inhale, mm -hmm. right? So if you see shark finning, you can think, okay, there's a prolonged expiratory phase. So what am I dealing with? I'm dealing with some sort of trapped air, probably in the lower airways. I'm dealing with a lower airway issue, right? Hopefully, you've seen some other things that have identified that someone's having an asthma attack or COPD, like they're breathing weird, and you're seeing that in a respiratory assessment, right? So we don't expect you to just hook up capnography and be like, yes, asthma. What we expect you to do is go, asthma, let me go ahead and put them on capnography. There's the shark finning. Now when I give them albuterol and I give them bronchodilators and I give them anti-inflammatory meds, I can see that working, right? So maybe if like, if I have someone who is having a moderate asthma attack versus a, a severe asthma attack, does it really look that different when you're just staring at the patient? No, you don't have anything to compare it to, right? But if I have someone who has a severe asthma attack, I see some severe shark finning, and I give them some bronchodilators, and I start to see that shark finning smooth out, even though they're still hyperventilating, they're still struggling, and they're having issues there, you know that your treatments are working. Well, what's cool about this scenario, too, is that you talk about an asthmatic, so they're hyperventilating, you see shark finning because they have this prolonged expiratory phase, their CO2 number is down because they're breathing off their CO2, they're acidotic in that way, right? Um so they're trying to get rid of all their CO2 and you give them a treatment and you see the CO2 climb back up and you see the shark finning starting to go away and you're like, awesome, my treatment's working. Let's, let's say you put a pulse ox on them. Right. They're 94%, right? And you give them a bunch of treatments and they start, they slow down their breathing and you're just still watching the pulse ox and now it's still 94% and you're like, okay, good. They're breathing better. And now they're not breathing because they actually were decompensating, not because you know what I mean? Like this can yeah, happen, right? So yeah. like asthmatics are going to go one of two ways. They're either going to slow their breathing down because they're getting better or they're going to slow their breathing down because they're about to die. Right? So in these scenarios, like the pulse ox really doesn't give you any information, mm -hmm. right? But the capnograph and the capnography can, because now I can see, now I give a treatment and I see, the CO2 still getting lower, 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 and the shark finning continuing and getting even more prolonged. Like, okay, this isn't working. I need to do something better. Exactly. I actually had a case, and this is, I think I've shared this before, but where I was able to use capnography to say that it wasn't asthma. So I had a woman come in. She looked asthmatic. She told me she was having an asthma attack. She was in her 40s. She was like, I'm having an asthma attack. She's hyperventilating. She's kind of wheezy, but it's hard to tell because she's like so restricted. She's breathing so fast. I don't, you know, you know how that happens, right? You can't really tell sometimes. If asthmatics are super restricted, you may not hear wheezing at all, which I've had that happen. And, you know, obviously her CO2 is low because she's hyperventilating and she's like, I'm having an asthma attack. I'm having an asthma attack. And I said, what, you know, when was the last time you had an asthma attack? She's like, well, I've never had one before. Oh. And she was 40. Which, like, is not to say that you can't develop, develop sure, asthma in your yeah. 40s, but I was like, you know what? I need more information. I put on the capnography. Her CO2 was low because she's hyperventilating. Her waveform was normal. Yeah. She did not have shark finning, which means she doesn't have restricted breath sounds. So instead of giving her a butyrol and solumedrol and, you know, all that good stuff. You sent her home. I gave her a dose of Ativan. <laughs> I gave her a dose of Ativan. Yeah. All of a sudden, she's remarkably better, right? There like, and, and yeah. it, like it actually did help in that way because I could have gone down a whole treatment path that would have been 
completely unhelpful. Right. And I would have worried that she was going into status. And I, you, you know what I mean? Like, well, not just, I mean, think of the beta agonist effects of, of effects of giving her like a bronchodilator right. and stuff. It probably would have amped up her anxiety quite yeah, a yeah. bit. Right. So like now I'm giving her something that technically makes her heart rate go a little bit faster. And like, and I'm I'll tell it to you a too, panicked person, uh oh, you know, her airways are more open, but I've just basically fed into a, a sympathetic and, nervous system. Situation. Right. And there have been times where I've given up like, asthmatic treatments to asthmatics and had it not work and had them be breathing so fast that i'm worried they're going to fatigue mm -hmm. i'll sedate them and intubate them mm -hmm. so good thing i didn't do that right i mean like, like, like that again right. like this gave actually gives so much more information that like we wouldn't have had otherwise you yeah know? and it's not too complicated right like it's it's some shapes it's basically one of two shapes right. <laughs> most of the time and and then some numbers and it's just kind of interpreting that data in the right way you can get a lot from it so let's go over real quick because i want to finish up here Let's go over some of the other like major uses for capnography, like just some quick and dirty, simple things that you can use it for. One, recognizing irregular respiratory patterns, or in, in your case, not the presence <laughs> right. of irregular respiratory patterns and confirming that there are regular, right? Two, uh, early detection of respiratory depression and airway disorders, especially when they're sedated. So, so if we, we have sedated someone in hospital um, and they are starting to decompensate, it's very hard to know when they're decompensating when we've applied sedation, right? Because they're just laying there, they're passed out, they're intubated maybe, right? We're going to recognize capnography changes far quicker than we're going to recognize anything on the pulse ox or vital, major vital signs changes like blood pressure and things like that, yeah. right? So whenever we're sedating someone, we obviously like that you want to sedate them to a point where they continue to breathe on their own. But the risk is, is that because sedation can be difficult, especially when you're doing like conscious sedation, like that they could stop breathing, right? If I wait for the pulse ox, we talked about this before, the blood can circulate multiple times with oxygen before the oxygen pulse ox number drops, but they stopped breathing a while ago. By using capnography, I can tell exactly the moment they stop breathing and I simply like arouse them a little bit, give them a jaw thrust, you know, maybe, you know, give them a breath. Like I can do that and never have the pulse ox drop. Because you can argue that when the pulse ox has dropped, it's a you've waited to really read a desaturation of the hemoglobin at the periphery, like what was happening at the brain and the heart and all that stuff in the meantime, right? It's like I mean, being like, I'll, I'll wait till their heart stops to do anything. Right. You know I mean, like, right. It's too yeah. late of a sign. You don't want yeah, to know exactly. So in sedation specifically, like you said, you, you know immediately when someone stops breathing. Right. Right? I mean, if you hooked yourself up to a pulse ox or a capnography right now, and you just held your breath, Flatline. You, yeah, you would flatline your, and, and that would be an indication, again, going back to some of the uh, examples we gave before, like your ventilation has stopped, and I can tell that your ventilation has stopped immediately. And I do have this in here, like it provides you live data, like live direct data that's going on right now. So um, some other things, ventilation, perfusion, and metabolism of breathing. So the, the CO2, the capnography can show you a lot more about what's happening on a cellular level in terms of diffusion than pulse ox would or anything like that, right? Because we can see kind of this transfer of CO2, how much CO2 versus, and then we can make the assumption of how much oxygen based off of how much CO2 we have, right? It can also give us a little bit of insight into acid-base balance. So we'll, we'll save this for another podcast. I don't want to go too far into like metabolic versus respiratory acidosis and things like that. But if you've heard of the Rome mnemonic, it means that respiratory opposite metabolic equal. So our equation is basically H3 plus bicarb which is HCO3, yeah. It's and not the, H3, it's H+. Plus. Oh, it's, it's just H+. Plus. H+, plus, yeah, I'm sorry. The H+, plus, the hydrogen ion plus HCO3 um, is equal to water, H2O, plus CO2, right? So we have to have that equation balanced. And the Rome mnemonic tells us that res respiratory opposite metabolic equal. So basically, if I have my CO2 is up and my bicarb is down, that's telling me that... It's a primarily respiratory issue. And if it's opposite, it's primary respiratory. So it's either exactly. respiratory acidosis. Whenever it's or opposite, right? If if your bicarb's up and your CO2 is down, you still know that you're dealing with a, a respiratory issue versus a metabolic issue, right? If they're equal each other, so if I am breathing off a bunch of CO2, so my CO2 is up and I am also have high bicarb values, that means that I have metabolic acidosis. That's why we're going to save more acid-base balance stuff. Yeah, I mean, the, the general gist here is that, like, you have to recognize that your body can only compensate certain ways, right? 
it can internally like play with your bicarb a little bit, which not that much, right? It just it, the main thing it can do is it can regulate your breathing. To breathe either off breathe, CO2, to either or, breathe off the acid, yeah. which is in the form of CO2, or keep the acid inside, you know, as in the form of CO2, right? Like we can either hyper or hypoventilate in response to some of these things, right? Now again, there's going to be times where like we want to know like is this a primarily respiratory issue or is this a primary metabolic? The big thing I think in like the big theme here is where we talk about acidosis. The, the mo I mean, like when you talk about like respiratory alkalosis, that's just hypoventilating. That's just not breathing. That's like, it's like retaining your CO2. You see that in you know, COPD patients, stuff like that, asthmatics. You can get some of that. Um, like metabolic alkalosis. Like there's some weird things that cause that that you don't run into every day. The big one is that we need to think about is, is metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis is like, diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, like these things that we do see often, right? When the body's not doing well and decompensating, it starts to build up acid. So when we're septic and we start getting lactic acidosis, when we have, you know, huge fluctuations in our blood sugar, like glucose technically is like an acid inside our body, our body's got to get rid of that acid so it starts to hyperventilate to blow off the CO2. And that's the whole thing is reading respirations is going to be our first clinical clue into what's happening inside the body if we're not drawing labs and looking at that stuff already, right? So a lot of times someone's respiratory pattern and their capnography reading can clue us into, hey, we need to do some blood draws here and take a look at what's happening metabolically because the body's compensating for something, right? It's doing Doing this for a reason so you need to be clued into this idea that just because they have a respiratory acute problem doesn't mean that the that the cause of that problem is respiratory in nature yeah right the cause of that problem could be metabolic in nature and that's why it's important to kind of look at and it's things. also important to look at the end title co2 just to even clue yourself in there's actually been some very cool research where like they've looked at using end title co2 and capnography to diagnose dka mm. Well, if you're an EMS or you're a nurse, I mean, like you're in emergencies, like that would be huge if you could diagnose it earlier on with something as simple. It's a simple, non-invasive tool that like, how do you know that this person, you, you, I mean, think about it this way. Like you come upon a person who has symptoms that are like they're lethargic and fatigued and all this stuff. Like how, how, what's on your differential there? Tons of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Throw on, I mean, you're going to check an AccuCheck, right? But even without the AccuCheck, which is technically a prick and invasive, you could throw on capnography, and if their CO2 is crazy low, it means that they're probably metabolically very acidotic. It would clue you into DKA earlier on or sepsis, right? Someone's got an infection and stuff like that, right? So these are the types of things that where like this tool is in, is non-invasive and can give you a lot of information and start to help diagnose things earlier on, which is obviously like you know always important. So right. Um, yeah, and then some other quick and easy things that you can use it for is is in CPR and in ROSC, like recognizing things. So this is the your cool, I think this yeah, is the this coolest is, thing. In terms of a, well, it's because you're an emergency doctor. That's true. <laughs> so, That's true. And, and I have Fair. a background in EMS. So it, it's, to us, like a big reason, a big use of capnography is using it in CPR. So if you want to measure the effectiveness of your compression, now compressions don't really have anything to do with like respirations or co2 so right we got to go back to our like four pillars right, right. ventilation perfusion we got we know how those all work together so now we can start to make assumptions about cpr effectiveness based on those same principles yeah if i'm shoving on your chest really hard and pushing your rib cage into your lungs and forcing air out what's that air going to do what's that air going to have in it co2 right so i can actually measure the effectiveness of how deep and how um forceful i'm i'm compressing based on your CO2 readings, even in a dead body, right? And how well am I, mo how well am I circulating or quote unquote, you know, outwardly helping the body perfuse in a way, right? Because again, if I am circling the blood effectively enough, there's always some oxygen being pulled in just through whether we're ventilating someone or just the negative pressure that we're creating with chest compressions. So there's going to be some exchange, right? right? So I'm going to, I should see some CO2 being quote unquote breathed off when I push down and push that air out. If I don't, then I'm not probably compressing the heart well enough to really circulate that blood in an effective way. Right. And that's the thing to recognize is that basically if you have end tidal readings during CPR that are less than 10, doesn't have anything to do with how you're breathing for that patient, has everything to do with how you're compressing for that patient. Mm -hmm. So compress better, harder, deeper, faster. 
that's what you're that's again, what you're struggling with if you have a reading less than 10. Really, your readings in a CPR should be between 10 and 15 or higher, right? We should we're shooting for 10 to 15 for adequate coronary perfusion pressure. As we do that, we might resuscitate them. Well, also, and, this is the cool part, right? So the if you're doing those compressions and you're circulating that blood, you can bag a person as much as you want. And that's ventilation, right? You can ventilate a person. You can push air into their lungs. But unless that oxygen gets loaded onto a blood blood uh, cell and hemoglobin and gets circulated to a tissue where it offloads that for and exchanges it for CO2 and gets back to the lung to be able to give that alveoli CO2 yeah. to breathe out, that's, you know, that's circulation. That's the actual chest compression piece. So to your point, it has nothing to do with bagging the patient. It has everything to do with, am I moving the blood well enough to be able to cause this cellular exchange to happen so that there is CO2 being exchanged to, to blow it off, right? Right. Bagging a dead body with no compressions isn't going to do anything for them at all right. because of those four pillars of respiratory physiology yeah. that we talked about, right? You have to touch on all those pillars, which means you got to circulate the blood. And if that's what's causing the CO2 exchange, right, then, then the only thing that can cause the CO2 to suddenly during CPR jump to 20, 25, 30 would be the heart doing it on its own better, which is ROSC. And that's what's so cool. So when you, if you see a spike in end tidal CO2 during compressions, you know you brought them back to life. That you brought them back. Whether you feel a pulse or not. And this is where, like, now I'm not saying that, like, disregard all the guidelines out there and don't check for a pulse, but, like, there's nothing else that can cause a increase in CO2 exchange other than the heart itself circulating blood better than your chest compressions can. Right. Right. Um, and I've had this happen too. With I had I actually had a resuscitation where we were using end tidal CO2. It was like 12, 13, 14. Chest compressions are going well. All of a sudden, it's 25. I'm like, hold chest compressions. We check for a pulse. We can't find a pulse. The guy's a big guy. He's a real big guy. We can't find a pulse. They're like back on the chest. I'm like, no, we don't have to get back in the chest. The end tidal CO2 is 25. There's nothing else that can possibly have caused that other than the fact that he has returned to spontaneous circulation. So I grabbed the, then I, you know, I had to confirm still though, right? right? So yeah. then I grabbed the ultrasound. I take a look. He does have good cardiac activity. Like we, we are able to circle a blood pressure then and that sort of thing. But like, that's pretty cool. That is like a completely non-invasive thing that is more accurate at, it is actually like the gold standard accurate for return of spontaneous circulation, even it's based also, on AJ guidelines now. It's also the gold standard for knowing whether you've intubated someone, right? So if I'm trying to check for place, placement of a tube, I obviously know I'm in the lungs if I get any CO2 reading with at all, right? If I don't have any CO2 re reading, then I'm obviously in the stomach. Right. So it's the gold standard for confirmation of intubation as well, mm -hmm. which is great. But one thing I do want to preface is that we're looking for a spike in CO2. So you can have dead bodies that are particularly acidic. And I've seen this in, in the field a lot. So like you might be doing CPR and the patient is like sitting around in the 20s a little bit with CO2 just in general from your compressions. You're still looking for a spike in them. So sure. if they need to spike up they might spike up into the 40s or something like that, and then you know that you've turned. So we're looking more for a distinct change and not necessarily for a specific number True. when when we're confirming ROSC. Yep, yep. So. so yeah, I think in conclusion, we just want to really reinforce the use of capnography out there in, in clinics, in the clinical setting, in the emergency you know field setting, um, really anywhere. And whenever you have a respiratory symptom or problem, we really think that capnography should be involved in terms of, you know, monitoring that patient so that you can recognize what's going on and seeing how your treatments are responding. So, yeah. and so I, again, I think that like, you know, do people use it for checking the endo, endotracheal tube placement? Yeah. Do we see it used in CPR? Sometimes probably not even in every CPR, but it should be in every CPR. But again, I think I would argue that it's non-invasive. It's can give you a lot of information. We probably should be using it for every respiratory patient as Absolutely. well as those things. So Absolutely. cool. So, all right, that's all we have for you for this week, and we'll see you next time for our 50th episode <gasps> anniversary what? extravaganza. I'm going to be in a hat. Okay. All right, you guys stay sweet. Hey, guys, thanks so much for taking a listen. Uh, if you are studying for the National Registry exam, we're here to help. We have a National Registry prep program uh, to help you pass that exam. Check us out at guardiantestprep.com. If you'd like continued education credits uh, for listening to our podcast or watching this on YouTube, 
Follow us at guardiancme.com. 100% free CAPSI credits. Uh, no matter what state or country you're in, uh, we're here to help. So again, we thank you so much for listening. We hope you have a wonderful week.